going to go over yet another uh, paper from physics and math tutor. This is um, the second episode in this series. Please make sure to go check on my channel for the first episode and also to get the link to the cheat sheet. Make sure you do. So today we'll be doing a paper that's about density but not limited to density. It's got elements of power, energy, work, time. It's basically a, quite a complex paper. Stick around to see the whole thing. So let's begin with the very first question. Figure 3.1 shows the water turbine that is generating electricity in a small tidal energy scheme. So we can see that there's a quite a detailed diagram here. Sea water level at high tide, bar, barrage, water level in tidal basin, 3 meters distance between the barrage and water level in tidal basin. There's a turbine connected to electricity generator. And that's basically the end. Let's look, look at the description. At high tide, 1 meter cubed of seawater of density 1030 kilograms per meter cubed flows through the turbine every second. So the keywords are basically 1 meter cubed of seawater and density of 1030 kilograms per meter cubed. Part A. Calculate the loss of gravitational potential energy when 1 meter cubed of seawater falls through a vertical distance of 3 meters. So remember, the main thing they want us to find is the gravitational potential energy. So the gravitational potential energy is represented by the formula mass times gravitational, uh, I mean acceleration due to gravity or acceleration due to free fall multiplied by the height. So the mass is basically, um, if we, if you look at the formula for density, that is mass over volume. So mass is basically volume times density. So the volume is 1 meter cubed multiplied by the density, which is 1030. And we get that the mass is 1030. So that's how I got 1030 as my mass. Now let's multiply it by 10, which is acceleration due to free fall, and multiply that by 3. So 10,300 times 3 is 30,900 joules. The symbol is J. Uh, that is basically the SI unit for gravitational potential energy, basically the SI unit for anything to do with energy. So three more questions, make sure you get this right. It's quite a lot of marks. Part B. Assume that your answer to A is the energy lost per second by the seawater passing through the turbine at high tide. The generator delivers a current of 26 amps at 400 volts. Calculate the efficiency of the scheme. So now, we need to know the formula for efficiency. Efficiency is basically output power over input power multiplied by 100. Now, what is power? Power is represented by the formula voltage times current, VI, because you have to use this formula. Also, you can represent sorry, by energy over time, but energy and time are not given, so the usage of the formula really depends on the data you're given in the question. In this question, I'm given the data of voltage and current, so I should just multiply 400 times 26. That's the power. That's my output power. How much does this machine give out in terms of power? So that over the input power, which is my answer in A, the amount of power that is inputted into that is put into the machine. I'm just going to uh, take that over 30,900 multiplied by 100. So now let's just simplify it. So once it's simplified, it's basically 26 times 4 over 309 times 100. The 26 times 4 is 104. 104 multiplied by 100 is 10,400 divided by 309. And the answer is approximately 33.7%. That's how efficient this turbine is. Remember, when you talk about efficiency, the only machine that is 100% efficient are thermal heaters. There is no other machine that can actually match to 100% efficiency. Because whenever you have a machine, there's always uh, some, part of the, some part of the power that is given to it that is lost as heat. Which is why thermal heaters are basically the most efficient, they're 100% efficient. Question 2. An ornamental garden includes a small pond which contains a pumped system that causes water to go up a pipe and to run down a heap of rocks. Figure 3.1 shows a section through this water feature. So we can see that the height between the base and the top is 0.8 meters. The pump is basically right down here. There's the water inlet. 
water runs down rocks, pumped water rises through the pipe, and there are rocks within here. The density of water is 1000 kilograms per meter cubed. A volume of 1 liter is equal to 0.001 meter cubed. Part A. Calculate the mass of 1 liter of water. So look, we're given density, we're given volume. So in order to calculate the mass, we need to first write down the formula. Density is mass over volume. So now let's cross multiply. Mass is density times volume. So we're just going to take the density, 1000 multiplied by the volume, 1000 times 0 0.01. The mass is 1 kg. As you can see that the units cancel out and hence it's remained with kilograms here. Part B. Calculate the work done raising 1 liter of water through a height of 0 0.8 meters. So look, in this case we cannot use the formula for work done because we do not have the appropriate data. But remember, work done is equal to gravitational potential energy. Hence we are going to use this gravitational potential energy formula to calculate work done. So I'm going to take the mass, which is the answer here, 1 kilogram, multiplied by the uh, acceleration due to gravity or acceleration due to free fall, which is 10, and multiplied by the height, which is 0 0.8. That leaves us with 8 joules, that's the work that is done. Part C. The pump lifts 90 liters of water per minute. Calculate the minimum power of the pump. Now, power is basically energy over time. So, how do we calculate energy? Basically, here it said that it lifts 90 liters of water per minute. Now, per liter, it takes 8 joules. So how many uh, joules does it take for 90 liters? So 8 times 90. And over the amount of time that it takes in seconds. Because if you remember, a watt is joules per second. Watt is in W80. So we're just going to take 8 times 90 over 60. The zeros cancel, so it's 8 times 9 over 6. 72 over 6 and power is 12 watts or basically 12 joules per second okay part d the pump is switched off immediately after the pump is switched off what is the value of the water pressure at the bottom of the 0 0.8 meter pipe due to the water in the pipe again let's look at the keyword here pressure pressure is the keyword so what is the formula for pressure in water? DGH, density multiplied by acceleration due to gravity or free fall multiplied by the height or depth. So the density is 1000 because we can get it from the question if we go back up all the way here. Uh, yeah, the density of water is 1000 kilograms per meter cubed. This is all part of one question. Multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity, which is 10. And that is multiplied by the depth, which is 0 0.8 meters. So when we multiply all of this together, we get that the pressure at the bottom of the pipe is 8,000 pascals. Okay. So let's see if we have missed any question. No. Question 3. The list below gives the approximate densities of various metals. Gold is 19 grams per cubic centimeter. Lead is 11 grams per cubic centimeter. Copper is 9 grams per cubic centimeter. Iron is 8 grams per cubic centimeter. At an antiques market, a collector buys what is advertised as a small ancient gold statue. When the collector tests it in the laboratory, he finds its mass is 600 grams and its volume is 65 cubic centimeters. Part A. In the space below, describe how the volume of the statue could be measured. You may draw diagrams if you wish. I prefer to draw a diagram. So, you're going to need a graduated beaker or graduated measuring cylinder it's basically the one that has marked readings on the side ignore my stupid drawing for a statue we're going to take this statue which is supposedly made of gold we're going to put it in but before doing all of this we're going to first place water in this measuring cylinder we're going to take its initial reading upon doing this we're going to now put the statue inside the beaker or cylinder then the water level will rise that's going to then you're going to take that reading. So, now we're going to take off the final reading, subtract the initial reading, and get that the volume of the statue is whatever it may be, dependent on the values. I hope you guys have understood this diagram. Okay, so let's move on to part B. 
Use the figures given above to decide whether the statue was really made of gold. Show your working. So we are given a table of values here. They all are values for density. We are given the mass of the statue and the volume of the statue. Remember, density is mass over volume. Since the table of data is all in density, I'd rather calculate the density. Because if you calculate the density, you can then compare to the table of data and if it matches, well, then it's cold. So it's going to take 600 grams over 65 cubic centimeters and we get that the density is 9.23 grams per cubic centimeter and obviously 9.23 grams per cubic centimeter is not equal to 19 grams per cubic centimeter and hence this statue wasn't made of gold. So we take the box, you know, uh, there's a bit of, uh, the scanning had a bit of an issue and so it's got cut, I apologize for that. Question 4. Figure 2.1 shows a reservoir that stores water. So you see this is the diagram, figure 2.1. There's the dam, there's the exit pipe, there's the valve, the difference between the top of the water and the exit pipe, the height basically is 20 meters. Basically that's the diagram. Part A. The valve in the exit pipe is closed. The density of water is 1000 kilograms per meter cubed and the acceleration of free fall is 10 meter per second squared. Calculate the pressure of water acting on the closed pipe, closed valve in the exit pipe. So, pressure of water. Pressure in liquids, again, is represented by the formula DGH, density multiplied by the acceleration of free fall multiplied by the height or depth in this case. So, the density is 1000. So, 1000 multiplied by 10, which is the acceleration of free fall multiplied by the distance, basically the depth, which is 20. And we get that the pressure is 200,000 pascals, or 2 times 10 power 5 pascals. Part B. The cross-sectional area of the pipe is 0 0.5 meters squared. Calculate the force exerted by the water on the closed valve. Remember, this is pressure, but that, uh, uh, this is pressure, but that doesn't mean this pressure is not applicable to the formula force over area. This pressure in liquids formula is derived from the force over area. That is, an, that is an explanation for another time. So, we're going to write down this formula. Because this is first of all the relation between force, area, and pressure. So, force is basically the area multiplied by the pressure. So, the area is 0 0.5 multiplied by the pressure, which is 200,000. And we get that the force exerted by the water on the closed valve is 100,000 newtons. Part C. The valve is then opened and water originally at the surface of the reservoir finally flows out of the exit pipe. State the energy transformation of this water between the surface of the reservoir and the open end of the pipe. So if you look closely at this diagram, we need to know what is moving and what is still. Before the opening of this exit pipe valve, we notice that the water is still. So that is potential energy. Now, upon opening of the valve, the water begins to flow. That is kinetic energy. So that's the energy transformation. Potential energy at the water surface, basically the still water, the energy stored in still stuff, is now changed to kinetic energy, energy found in moving objects. Now, it's changed to kinetic energy at the pipe exit. The main thing is there's a change of potential to kinetic energy. I just wrote down the location so you get an idea of where this change actually starts and where this change actually takes place. Okay, yeah, there's been a slight mess up with numbers. It's just the website itself. It's free, so you can expect this kind of stuff. So, part A of this supposedly number question, I, th I take it as number five. State an example of the conversion of a chemical energy to another form of energy. Example. You can say battery. Now, the energy conversion is chemical to electrical. There are many examples, I'm sure you guys can find so many more. Such as maybe you can say the human body, you can change basically uh, the chemical to kinetic. For example, we eat food, that's chemical energy. Okay, And then we move around or we start running, that's kinetic energy. Part B, the electrical output of a solar panel powers a pump. The pump operates a water fountain. The output of the solar panel is 17 volts and the current supply to the pump is 0.27 amps. Roman 1. 
calculate the electrical power generated by the solar panel. So now that we have voltage and current, we know that the power formula to be used is voltage times current. So we're just going to take 17 times 0.27 and we get that the power is 4.59 watts. Roman 2. The pump converts electrical energy to kinetic energy of water with an efficiency of 35%. Calculate the kinetic energy of the water de delivered by the pump in one second. Now, all of us know that the formula for kinetic energy is half mv squared, but another formula for kinetic energy is efficiency multiplied by the input power. So in this case, 35 over 100 multiplied by the input power, which is 4.59. And we get that the kinetic energy is 1.61 joules. That's the, basically uh, the energy that is used to move the water in one second. If the pump, okay, the pump propels 0.00014 meter cubed of water per second. This water rises vertically as jet. The density of water is 1000 kilograms per meter cubed. Calculate the water propelled by the pump in one second. So, we want to find the mass of water. We're given the density and we're given the volume. This is why it's really useful in physics to note down the data you have because if you fail to note down the data, you will not know which formula to use as there are tons of formulas to use for one question. So in this case, because I've been given density and volume, I can use the density equals to mass over volume formula. Make m the subject of the formula, which is basically cross multiplying V times D. And I would take 0 0.00014 times 1000, and that gives me the mass is 0 0.14 kilograms. Part, I mean, question two, I mean, whatever this is, this mess up number, it's part of the same question. Take it as, yeah, it's part of the same question. The maximum height of the jet of water. Now, we do know that, uh, we know the amount of energy it uses, right? That is 1.61 joules, because that's kinetic energy. We want to find the height. If you remember, gravitational potential energy lost is kinetic energy gained. So something standing still has potential energy. When it starts moving, that energy that it will use to be there when it's still is lost, but it's not gone. That energy is now converted into energy that moves. So we're just going to write this down in terms of equations. So mgh is equal to half mv squared. So we're trying to find the height, so we we'll leave that as h. So we know the mass is 0.14 kilograms. This is all part of the same question, which is why you need to look up sometimes to use the values. Make sure you always uh, check if the question is part of the same Roman number, because sometimes the part, maybe you do a, a part A of the same question, and the value of part A needs to be used in part B. So make sure when you're doing, when you're attempting physics questions, you're quite sure of your answer. Because if you aren't sure of your answer, then you might as well got, get a question wrong, because especially if they depend on each other, and they're worth a lot of marks, especially as you can see that this question is worth nine marks. So make sure that you get your steps right, you get your formulas right, and you make sure that your answer is right, and when you write down your answer, just be sure to double check it. You never know when you have written something else. I can tell you from experience, I've done that a lot of times. So now, let's move on to the actual understanding of the equation. So we're just going to take 0 0.14 times 10 times height, and that is equal to 1.61 joules. We do not need to write half mv squared, actually, because we do not have the velocity, but we know that this is equal to 1.61. And we, have, we do not need to kind of prove what's the velocity, they just need the height. So just now when you multiply everything here, 0 0.14 times 10 is 1.4 h, that is equal to 1.61. We want to isolate h, and so divide both sides by 1.4, and we get that the maximum height of the jet of water is 1.15 meters. Question 2, part A. A stone falls from the top of the building and hits the ground at a speed of 32 meters per second. The air resistance force on the stone is very small and may be neglected. Roman 1. Calculate the time of the fall. Now let me tell you something. Gravitational, uh, uh, the speed due to gravity right acceleration due to gravity is equal to the velocity over time okay so if they ever ask you to prove that g is equal to 10 you will take the velocity given over the time given in this case we need to make t the subject of the formula 
and we need to solve for it basically. So we're going to first make the subject of the formula t times g is equal to v. We want to isolate t, so we divide both sides by g, and we get that time is velocity over acceleration to gravity. We take the velocity, which is 32 divided by 10, and we get that the time is 3.2 seconds. Part 2. On figure 1.1, 1 .1, draw the speed time graph for the falling of the stone. Ignore this. This 40 was supposed to come here. It's just an error. It can expect that with free stuff. So how would this graph be? Look, when you're, when something, uh, look at this. G stands for acceleration. Now you're dropping something through the air. It's obviously accelerating. Now, when it, now we know it's accelerating, so the curve must incline. We know only one point in this graph. That is the 3.2 second time and the speed was 32. So we're going to use those, plot that one dot, join it from 0, 0 all the way to our plotted dot. And that would basically show us an inclining curve explaining to us that there is acceleration due to gravity and that with each passing second, the acceleration increases the velocity of the object. Roman 3. <sighs> the weight of the stone is 24 newtons. Calculate the mass of the stone. Weight is basically mg, mass times g. Now we're going to make mass the subject of the formula, hence we divide both sides by g. So the mass is 24 newtons over 10 newtons per kilogram, and we get that the mass is 2.4 kilograms. Part B. A student used a suitable measuring cylinder and a spring balance to find the density of a sample of the stone. For those who don't know what's a spring balance, it's basically the item that has a hook at the bottom and can you can attach something to it and it measures the weight of the object, not the mass. Search up Google for more images right now, if you're still curious about where it is. I'm pretty sure most of you already have an idea, okay? Ignore that, let's move on. So describe how the measuring cylinder is used in state readings readings that are taken. So we're going to take the volume of the water before actually using it to measure the volume of the stone. We're going to put it in the measuring cylinder, take note of the reading. Then we're going to immerse the stone in the water, make sure it's completely submerged, and we're going to take the new volume. And then we're going to subtract the two, and basically we get the, the, the volume. Part two, describe how the spring balance is used and state the reading that is taken. So we want to hang the rock on, on the balance, basically the hook thing I was, taking, I was telling you, we want to attach a string, hook the rock, and basically we're going to calculate, it's going to pull down on the hook, and there's going to be a scale, rate the scale, the scale is going to be in newtons. It measures weight. Part 3, write down an equation which, from which the density of the stone is calculated. Mass over volume, there's this main formula. The student wishes to find the density of cork. Suggest how the apparatus and the method would need to be changed. So basically, you, the cork has a smaller density than water, so it would float on water. Now we need to submerge it. So we would tie the rock to the cork. That would sink the cork. Then we would take this reading of the cork and rock, and we're going to subtract it from the reading of the rock. So rock, rock dies, and we're left with the cork. So that's the volume of the cork. Question 3. Okay, this is spring balance I was talking to you about. I'm pretty sure most of you can recognize it right now. Okay, a scientist needs to find the density of a sample rock was down a mine. He only has a spring balance, some measuring cylinder, some water, and some thread. Part A. In the space below, draw two label diagrams. One to show the spring balance being used, and the other to show the measuring cylinder being used with a suitable rock sample. I guess you guys can look at this diagram, pause it, and look at it. So basically, you just draw a thread, you attach it to the rock, you take the reading, divide it by 10 to get the mass of the rock, then multiply it by 1000 to get the mass in grams. And we do what we've been discussing this whole video about the measuring cylinder and how to take the reading. We're going to get the volume of the rock in cubic centimeters, and then we're going to divide the mass or volume and we get the density. Part B. The spring balance is calibrated in newtons. State how the mass of the rock may be found from the reading of the spring balance. I explained it, divided by 10, because 1 kilogram is 10 newtons. 
So now part C state the readings that will be taken from the measuring cylinder. Reading of water is then of water plus rock basically. So basically you're going to first take the reading of the water, then you're going to take the reading of the water plus the rock, and then you're going to find the difference to get the volume, which is the answer to part D. State in words the formula would be used to find the density of the sample. This formula is recurring throughout the whole episode, but it's going to take mass over volume. Okay. A student is given the following apparatus in order to find the density of a piece of rock. 100 grams mass, meter rule, suitable pivot on which the rule will balance, measuring cylinder that is big enough for the piece of rock to fit inside, cotton, water. The rock has a mass of approximately 90 grams. Now, I want to jog your memory a bit, guys. Go back to the topic about moments. This will help a lot when answering this question. So, part A, Roman 1. In this space below, draw a label diagram of apparatus from this list set up so that the student is able to find the mass of the piece of rock. So, we're going to draw the pivot. We're going to draw a straight line for a meter rule. Basically, the pivot is in the middle of the meter rule, at the 50 centimeter mark. We're going to put the 100 grams mass on the other side, and we're going to put the rock on the other side. Now, we're going to have to adjust the distance of the rock such that it balances or we're going to maybe have to adjust the distance of the 100 grams so that the meter rule is perfectly balanced in a straight line. Now, the question comes, state the reading that the student should take and how these will be used to find the mass of the rock. So basically the reading he must take is basically the distance from the pivot and he, how he would use this, basically using the moment formula. The mass of this multiplied by the distance from the pivot and that is equal to the rock mass which we're trying to find multiplied by the distance of the pivot we're going to solve for the uh, x, and in this case, x basically means the rock. And remember, the meter rule must be balanced. If the meter rule is not balanced, this formula does not apply. Part B. Describe how the volume of the rock could be found. We've done this time and time again. You just put the water in the cylinder, read the value, put the rock in the water, read the new value, and take the differences of the values. Part C, the mass of the rock is 88 grams and its volume is 24 centimeters cubed. Calculate the density of the rock. So the density is basically mass over volume, we're just going to take 88 grams over the volume which is 24 centimeter cubed. Simplified by 2 is 44 over 12. Further simplified by 2 that is 22 over 6. And again further simplified by 2 that is 11 over 3. And the distance, I mean sorry, not the density, is 3.7 grams per cubic centimeter. That's the end of the episode guys, if you enjoyed this please smash that like button and hit the subscribe button, see you guys next time.